Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Our interview last week was so good that we decided to turn it into a two-part series. If you missed last week, you'll find the link in the show notes. It's not mandatory that you listen, but we want to make sure that you don't miss out on this amazing conversation. Hey everyone, it's uh, Roxanne Durhach. How are you again today? Um, So glad everybody's uh, tuning in. Today I have uh, David Thomas, and you said you're based in Halifax? North London, is that what it is? Tell me exactly. No, like the, the north of England. North of England. Here I say north of London. I missed I mistook what you said. Um, so he is an expert. Now you tell me a little bit about um your background. Is it that you you're a memory expert? Is that what I read? Something to do with memory. So, so tell me about that. I was reading a little bit about your background and we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to chat about today. Well, my background is that I had a, a troubled childhood, never went to college, got kicked out of school, working in a factory for like $2 an hour. And then I joined the fire service. And when I was in the fire service, I had trouble passing my exams. And one day I saw a guy memorize a pack of playing cards on TV, bought his book, taught myself how to do it. Eight months later, I went to the World Memory Championships, came forth, found I just had a gift. And then everybody's like, how do you do this memory stuff? And I said, it's just that easy. It's a few techniques and they got to teach me the techniques. And so back in February 9, 1997, they gave me first talk. And for the following, and then very soon after that, I left the fire service, broke a Guinness record. And then and then that was for 15 years. And then in 2011, somebody came out of an audience and just said, would I show them how to improve their presentation skills? I said, I don't do that. That's not my bag. And she said, I want you to do it. And I said, why? And she says, because you are brutally honest and you are a fantastic speaker. If you can reverse engineer what you do, then I think you can show me how to be a better speaker. I said, fantastic, because I'll do anything, me. I'll have a go at anything once, (laughs) right? Just pretty much anything. And I said, right, we'll have a go. I said, if it's rubbish, don't pay me. And even to this day, I've got a, a video testimonial. And she said, this was great. So then I moved away from the brain training, the memory, mind mapping and so on. Moved over towards the, um, all pretty much all towards presentation skills, mainly working with C-suite, middle to senior management and about half of the work I do is with the boss. Oh. And, I, and this, this was interesting as well. I said, um, I said, right, we've got three major problems. You're doing that. Your start is terrible. You need to do this. You're this and this. And he said, mate, you, you need to get this stuff sorted. And he looked at me and went, I'm glad I met you. And I said, why? He said, because my, I, be, I always ask my team. <laughs> I, I say, I always ask my team how I'm doing. And they go, yeah, you're doing great, boss. Yeah, you're doing great. Because <laughs> they're just that, dead. That is, they're dead. You ask for feedback from your team. And what, you know, I've, I've heard, you know, so many people share those things, uh, David, where they talk about, oh, you know, we did this, this, you know, external consultant came in and everything is good, but everybody at the senior team is like, they're falling like flies, but they're telling the CEO that everything is fantastic, right? Because people are afraid to, you know, tell the person that say is running the organization or the senior leader, what, what really is wrong, right? So I think your approach, as much as it's direct, it must work for some people because you need to hear what you're not doing well. And how often might they get coached to be able to get told that? I mean, I, I don't get work blind. Pe- people, I get referrals and recommendations or people come back and use me over and again. I, I, you know, I don't get work. People know what I'm like. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm never aggressive. I am never rude. I am never obnoxious. I don't swear at my clients. I don't embarrass them. I don't make them feel small. But I am bullet straight. And every chief exec loves it male and female 50 percent of my clients are female they love it because they just don't get it anywhere else 
anywhere else at all. The share, you know, they could be running a company and have a board of directors and they'll sit in front of the board and directors. They then have to leave the room while the board of directors talks about them. I mean, you know, that that's why being a chief exec is the best and worst job in the world. Because you've just, you, it's completely isolated. You really, you know, if you tell, if you if you look weak, if you're asking for advice from your subordinates, and 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 yet, how do you improve? And if you do, there's always a line. It does, I mean, it's the same in any relationship. You know, I have, you know, Karen, my soulmate, right? We live together, and you know, she she's she's everything to me, but there really is very little that I, I, uh, the, the, I'll, I'll rephrase it. There really is only so far I can go with Karen before she would just break down in a heap on the floor. And it's not very much. She's softer than a, you know, a Labrador puppy dog. You know what I mean? She's yeah. just softy. Me, I'm like, I to, honestly, I love brutal honesty. I love I love humour that's pitch black. There's almost nothing you could say to me. Nothing you could say to me to upset me or offend me. But Karen, she's really soft. So everybody has a line over you which you can't, you won't cross. And everybody says they like honesty, but they don't. They're like their version of honesty. Right, absolutely. And, you know, with the my, my new book, I do an assessment of the qualities that it takes for a leader to be more resilient within him or herself so that he, but they're doing an assessment on themselves, but their team's doing it on them as well. And oftentimes, what do we do, right? A lot of people, they have blind spots, right? Because they don't want to kind of see it. We're good, very good at seeing our positives, but not so good at being vulnerable enough to see our negatives. But when the team does the assessment, and then the leader does the assessment, we collate both of, both of those things. That's when the leader really sees, wow, I'm thinking I'm really good with, say, recognition or I'm good with communication. But my team saying, I've given myself, say, 80%. Of my team saying I'm 20%. There's a disparity, obviously, that at that point is showing the leader that he or she needs to start looking at what they're not doing well. They, again, getting out of their subjective world and getting into the objective world of the people that they're leading around them and what do they need differently from them. So it's it's interesting that you say that about um, with some of these senior leaders. <laughs> who's, who's telling them what the reality is about what they're not good at? Not many people, to your point, right? So let's, let's talk about, I'm a leader, I come to you. And um, what are you, how are you assessing my capacity? Um, to see how I communicate, um, what I'm good at, what I'm not good at. So do you tailor uh, your kind of way you work one-to-one -one with individuals or is it like a rote, like you said, a 22-step process? What, what do you do with someone? Well, about 80% of my work is, is guys who come to me, people who come to me, male, female, uh, everybody, and they have a specific talk they want to give. Okay. So like tonight, I've been working with a guy. He's got a talk in Barcelona in two weeks and it's 50 minutes long. And he's like, how do I make this amazing? And we go through it bit by bit. And so the, going through the 22 stages is not necessary. What I do is I sit there and I go, right, you, you've got 60 seconds to grab the retention. What's your one lightning rod theme? What is your one theme? You can only have one. I don't care if you're speaking for 15 minutes or 15 hours, you can only have one. What is your one lightning rod thing? And they go, right, okay. So what it does is it focuses their mind. And then I sit there and I go, what are the three areas that you would like to cover in your talk that feed up into that one lightning rod theme? And that's what we've done. So, you know, with this guy, the one lightning rod theme is unity. So he's got 16 different units across the world. He's bringing them together into one section. So it's about unity. That's that one lightning rod theme. The three things that go underneath it are motivation, strategy, and resilience. And so what we've done is we worked out, you know, so the first five minutes is talking about motivation, how they're doing really well, what the numbers are and, you know, success strategy is about how they're going to implement bringing everybody together and resilience is, you know, you know, how it's going to work in the long term and how they're going to work in terms of leadership. And so what I do is we do that and we go through it bit by bit. But the fact is that I'm in a place now where I've been doing this for 12 years as a coach and I've never found so far, I've not, not had anybody who's been able to present as well as me or who's been able to write a script as well as me. So instantly, the moment somebody gives me a script, I go, well, actually, if we did that. So I'll give you a quick example. So tonight he said to me, I've got 74 people in the room and we've got about maybe 14 or 15 of them are leaders. And what I want them to do is stand up 
and you know and i want them to be recognized in the room i said brilliant so i want you to stand i'm going to stand them up then i'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about what we're going to do with these guys as leadership i said that's a terrible idea and he says why i says would you want to stand up for two minutes in silence while everybody is looking at you and he went no i says then that's not what we're going to do we'll get them to stand up you say who they are and they're amazing everybody goes around and applause then they sit down then you do the two minutes he went that's brilliant Mm -hmm. that's a di that's my 25 years half a million people 60 countries drilled into me watching other people being a speaker every audience you can imagine i understand that and he's a he was he's a brilliant speaker this guy i'm working with actually mm -hmm. but he wants to just be he's he's a nine out of ten but he wants to be ten he wants to be a rock star and so that is a, you know that was a simple example and it's a, so sometimes he's already got a speech like that we go through it line by line and i change what needs to be changed so do you find that a lot of the keynote so it's a keynote speech at that point or is it just like a speech to um, a company so do you do different types you do keynotes you do it was um leaders are speaking at quarterly meetings board meetings every type all types of uh, speaking david it's only important speaking because it won't pay me fee for a small for a small talk. I mean, why would you? Right, you know, yeah. I cut, you know, I charge a fortune, so they're not going to pay that. They're not going to pay that for. You know, it has to have a level of importance. Right. Besides, besides which, you know, by the time you get a get a boss who's a chief exec, he's done a million team meetings. Right. Right. For sure. But he, he's maybe only done two board meetings, mm -hmm. and you know. He, Honestly, I could go on forever, but you know, they are big talks. It's people who've who've got a talk to give in Budapest, like I had earlier this year. And it's uh, you know, it's Budapest. She's she was uh she's taken over the family firm, they've got a new new product. If it doesn't work, it's gonna go under. You know, she's nervous, right? She's nervous but excited, but she needs to nail that talk. She needs to nail it. And so we sit there when we're working on that's an important talk. You know, I had a guy who is in Monaco and he we spent two hours last week because he's just um he's just he wanted just a bit of an assistance on a small talk actually that he's given a monthly meeting. But we've worked together before like 14 or 15 times. And he just said, you know, I need a bit of help, Dave. I'm, I'm not really sure what to do with this. So he shows me a few slides and then I say, right, but it's an important meeting because his staff have doubled in a in a year from 250 to 500 over the next year it's going to be 500 maybe a thousand inside 10 years it's entirely possible a guy's going to be a billionaire it's just it's just insane what they're doing it's a privately held company and he started it he started it at 14 on his bedroom table so the thing is that the the, the you know sometimes it's a single very very important talk or in his case it's getting to the stage where he's got so many members of staff that spread all over the world that every time he even does something like a monthly meeting, it has a massive ripple across the company. So therefore, it's still important, just in a different way. So do you teach things differently? Like you're saying um, with this particular person that you just coached, um, they may have multinationals or people all over the world, um, and some of them are in person and some of them aren't. Is there a strategy that you also teach about how to engage if they're if everybody's not in the room? And unfortunately, they're live with some people and it, you know in other cases some of them are virtual yes i mean the guy the guy in monaco got in touch with me first in lockdown he oh, had wow. he, he he'd been used to flying everywhere all over the world and meeting his team and then he got in touch with me about three months into lockdown and he, he saw my podcast he got in touch and he said i've listened to your podcast how much are you and i said and i said this much and he said i want to do six months because i just don't know what to do i don't know how to present to on zoom really effectively he said i've done it once i don't know if it's any good that's his issue oh, so i said send me, send me a copy of the video so he sends me a copy of the video and it's 40 minutes long and so we have the first meeting he said what do you think and i said well it's twice as long as it needs to be he says i can't cut 50 percent out i said yes you can then he said to me and then i said to him i said i can give you a 40 minute talk in three minutes and he goes I don't think you can do that. And I said, if I can't do it in three minutes so that it makes sense, I'll give you all the money back you paid me, which is five figures. It went off you got that. And I did it in three minutes and he went, that was incredible. He said, now I can see how I can do it in 20 minutes. Every single one after that was 20 minutes. 
Then eventually, when they came out of lockdown, they had a conference this year in Croatia, the senior management team, I was working with seven of them, to all everybody, and I was invited, I went over there, we did it on Zoom and then, and so on. And the first thing that happened when I met all this senior team was good, said, you know what, Nick was great after he'd spent some time with you. He's, he's, it was short, it was this, it was this and that and the, and the other. So the thing is that I, I don't, I have I have a process, like with the management team this week, um, where I have the nine people who are really nervous, we go through a process because they don't have a specific talk to give. So I've got two days, a month apart, half of it is on the first day, then the second half is in, is in three weeks. And that's when I go through the 22 stage process. Now I do mod modify it for them. So I've had a chat with the boss. He tells me what kind of work they do. Everybody's in different departments. Some are in tech, finance, some are in tech because we're across the whole company. But they all have to give presentations now to the directors and the board. Okay. Therefore. Okay. So you have Absolutely. a specific. So if someone's presenting in person, but they also have people virtually, there's things that you teach them to engage differently versus if they're... Yeah, if they yeah, yeah. What are, yeah. Some of those, what are some of those things that maybe leaders listening might um might be good if you're, doing, if you're doing a hybrid where you've got people in the room and you've got people on online yeah. the most important the, the single most important thing to do is recognize the people online so oddly enough the firm that i've just been talking about in croatia that are based in monaco and that i worked with them in croatia they invited me last december to do a keynote motivational speech to the whole company and i i did it in london there's only 50 in the room but it's like 300 online so what it is, is 300 people and there's a camera down the middle. and But the most important thing you've got to do is look down the barrel of the lens. Mm -hmm. So what you do is, as you go around the room, you do your normal eye contact, but remember there's 300 people. And so what you do is you look at, you know, like I'm looking at you, I'm, I'm looking at the camera. So what I do is I'm looking around the room, doing my usual thing, and then I come back to the camera. And even when I'm saying, and you guys out there in on Zoom land, yeah, welcome. Thank you for coming. Yes, you, I'm talking to you, sunshine. And that's what you do. So you make sure that you engage them because you forget the cameras there. You forget people are online. And the most important thing is to engage them as well. Absolutely. Like you're looking right at me. I'm probably looking away because of where my camera is. But so let's talk about, let's say leaders that are listening, right? And they're saying, yeah, well, we invest in speaking um, or we get, you know, we do professional development and, but, you know, I don't know that I've seen the return in the training dollars that we've used. What, what kind of guidance would you give them? Nobody's ever come to me wanting a return on investment that was of a financial basis in 12 years of doing this. They just wanted to be a better speaker okay which was which is which has been interesting yeah because i would think it would be the flip david because let's say so you're saying that they come because they, they want them to get along better or they want them to speak better what what is it most people that come to you what what's the what's the triage point in for you it's oh, not, they, they, they have a pain point they do have a pain point but okay. they can't they can't articulate it financially so for example you know, when the when the when the lady came to me and said, I'm speaking in Budapest and I'm delivering this keynote speech and I've got to nail it because me, I need to sell my product. We didn't she didn't turn around and say, I'm going to expend X amount on you to get 10x back in terms of the product sales. She just said, I understand it's worth investing in you. Just even if it's only on the off chance that I'm going to get more sales. So I've never had anybody in 12 years, but that's dealing with the boss. They don't really work on those kind of metrics. Mm -hmm. That the problem is, if I'm speaking to the what the, uh, the, this is fascinating, right? So I worked with a hedge fund five years ago, and they came to me and they said, "Right, we have to pitch, and we, you know, we, we, you know, we've got five hundred million assets under management. We're trying to get it to a billion. We think you can help." So I spent two days with these guys, and it was the four members of the management team. So it was this chief investment officer. Um, chief ops officers, chief financial officer, chief exec, right? And so we spent two days together and they paid me X amount of money. And it was a lot of money. And they could, and they they were there because they're out there in front of pension funds trying to get the money off them to invest. They then said, Would you speak to our the leadership team underneath, the ones who are in charge of each individual section? We've got like 10. I said, Yes. They said, Would you give us a discount? And I said, Why? Mm. and they went 
well, the like the leaders of the you know the 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 just kind of senior managers, and I go, but you paid this much for four of you, and you wanted me to pay you wanted to pay me less for ten, and and they, and they just went yeah. So what's interesting is that on some level they see they they have a metric inside their head that is based on some kind of notional return on investment. But the the lower down the food chain you get at work, the less they see that return in investment, and therefore the more they want a discount. And that's happened a few times. So the chief exec phones up and he goes, I've got this big talk to give how much I am going like this much. And they go, that's a lot of money. And I always say the same thing. I'll find you somebody cheaper. And they go, no, it's fine. I'll just use you. So they, they, they make a decision. So, right, when, when can we do it? And most of them come here, they come to my house. I don't even have to leave the house. It's brilliant, right? No travel. Come on. I, I love I love no travel. And I've done too many hotels and too much travel. I'll do it for the right work, but I'm happy that, you know, a bit more work at home. And so they just made that decision. And it's just, that's it. So in their head, there's a, re, you know, they pay the money to get a return on investment. But, but yeah, it's interesting though, though, you know, you think that they would want to make the same kind of, if they saw the value, like you said, and you deliver um, that you know, really your front foot facing customer, like it, it ripples down, right? From here to here to here, all the way to the front line. And whoever, if you're, uh, you know, who's your customer and how are they interfacing if the frontline people don't have the same kind of skills, right? So the, in, you know, so if it's too high up, how does it get translated down all the way? So I would say that, you know, it makes sense that you equally invest all the way through the different levels of management because- Yeah, but you're, you're, logic, you're trying to logic it through. You're trying to use logic to explain an emotional situation. The, the bottom line is a, a chief exec gets in touch with me and they go, I have this problem. That is the opening line they come with. Mm -hmm. So for them, the problem is a, a nine out of 10. Mm -hmm. But when they look at their team, they go, well, we're still making money. The problem is only five out of 10 because it's not their problem. It's one, um, it's just one um, level removed. Mm -hmm. So they don't, see, come, you know, they don't see the reality you're saying. They see their problems, but they don't see how it affects the others in the organization. Well, they don't feel the they don't feel the problem. They don't feel it. Okay. No, they don't. They don't feel it. It's a bit like, you know, I live with Karen, and and she's my soulmate. You know, if I wake up in the morning and I've got a problem, and then she turns around and says she's got a problem, my problem would be far more important than hers to me. Mm -hmm. Hers will be far more important to her than mine. Mm -hmm. That's just human nature. I mean, I want her to be happy. Her happiness is my happiness. If she's unhappy, I'm unhappy. But, you know, let's be brutally honest, right? Her issue is a nine out of 10 to her. To her me, it's a six. My problem is a nine out of 10 to me, but to her, it's a six. Now, when you, and we live together, we work together, we, we live in the same house. You know, she's my everything. When you go to work, you know, yeah, we all want. We all believe that chief execs sit there and go, "It's my family. These are like my family." No, they're not, mm -hmm. because the moment the company starts going under, you just take somebody and kick them out. You know that's the brutality of life, right? That's just the way it is. And you might not want to sack somebody. I get that, but ultimately you would to keep the ship afloat. You'd kick people out of the hot air balloon to keep it in the air, right? You just would. So the thing is that. When, when a chief exec gets in touch with me, they've got a problem, it's in their, in their head, it's keeping them awake at night. But when, you know, one of the sales guys comes up and he goes, I'm not closing enough sales and, and I don't, and I, feel, and I feel nervous and, and, I, and I wish I, how do I handle my nerves when I'm speaking? The boss doesn't go, oh my God, that's a massive problem for me too. Let's go out and get you somebody. They're like, sort it out, go and find somebody, go on a course, do what you need to do. But you know, it's what just even one degree of one degree removed, and everything changes. Mm -hmm. And I guess my work is different from yours, right? Because I talk to them about looking at how they're impacting others when I assess their skills. So it's and then teaching them about sitting in awareness and looking at you know what is their story, what you know, and these are companies that want to deal with that as well, right? Like if they want to understand. What is your, I call it return on relationship versus return on investment. If you are connected and not every company is going to see that way, but the companies that I deal with 
they want the leaders, the leader wants to learn how to connect in a different way so that he or she can impact the others so that they can function and ripple out from there, right? So it's just a different kind of perspective compared to what you're saying, which is, you know, the leader sees his or her concern. They will invest in them, but they may not um, invest in the different levels all the way to the front line, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, not every company is the same. You know, the guy, oh, the guy, the, the guy, the guy, you know, the guy that booked for me in the internet company over here, he's paying the same for the temp. You know, he he booked me to do presentation skills for him and the very senior people, and there were ten of them. Yeah. And then, and then he said, "Right, I've got another tier of people. Will you come in?" I said, "It's the same money." He said, "Fine." So he paid the same money because he saw the benefit and he loved it and thought it was great and he wants the same for his team. So I'm 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 kind of generalizing. Mm -hmm. it, well, it is, that makes that, that makes sense, right? I think it depends on the company as well, right? Like, I mean, what they want to achieve, just like you said, long term. What are they wanting, or are they just kind of seeing it from you know them and their senior leadership teams? Now let's let's talk a little bit about um, what are some of the things. Um, that you saw are some of the biggest pitfalls that you see when you deal with senior leaders, when you're trying to teach them about becoming a rock star? What are some of the biggest pitfalls that you see? Mm. The greatest challenge with, with improving anybody's presentation skills is that it's not like running a company. What you do is you get somebody in a silo who is brilliant at that job. I mean, nowadays it's accepted business practice that whoever's good at doing tech, you leave them in tech. You don't take them out of technology and put them in the finance department, right? You make sure that everybody in, is, is a superstar in their individual arena, right? The problem is when you stand and present, you've got to do it all. You've got to learn how to use tech. You've got to learn how to use humor. You've got to learn how to tell stories. You've got to learn how to use technology, how to do good PowerPoint, how to manage your time, how to be able to own the stage, how to be able to connect with the audience, how to ask questions. You've got to be able to do it all. And so the, the only thing that is a challenge for me going through a day with anybody, and it, it's less of a challenge and, and more of, of, of the process, I need to find out what they can't do. And we need to have a really specific conversation and the biggest one is humor. They all think they're more funny than they are. <laughs> and generally they're not that funny. <laughs> no, no, they're not. Right. It's all dad jokes and 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 you know, they're just stuff that they can say around the coffee machine, or they say, you know, they say in maybe a team meeting, but then they get out onto a stage in front of 200 people and it yeah. doesn't travel. It doesn't so we we need a we need a recalibration. <laughs> what they think is funny. But you know, I've I've had it the other way where I Martin Thatcher, the 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 cider guy who was um you know who's got the business and he spoke at the Houses of Parliament. We did some work and I've spent a lot of time in the US. So my dad's got a green card. Uh, my dad's been out there for 50 years. I've had a green card. I've spoken in 40 US states, and you know, so I know that I know America very well, lived in New York, Chicago, um, Denver, um, Richmond, and so we, he was speaking at Chicago at CiderCon, Cider Convention. So he was a keynote speaker. And I did some humor for him because he was he's, he's not naturally the most funny guy. But he, he we did some humor and I gave him a line and it worked really, really well. But he had no idea what he was really saying. And and it worked. And right. so, you know, so the, the line was because we were going on, we were, we were talking about family a lot because it's, you know, his business has been going two thirds. Uh, sorry. 40% of the, the entire history of the United States, which is an interesting concept. His business is 130 years old. Wow. So we, we play on that in the States because, you know, everything yeah, everything is new in America. So we're playing on that all the time. And I, I gave him a line, which was a great line. He said, my dad's still in the business, my father. It says, and he says he will stop working in the business when, oh, what's she called? Oh, you know what, memory guy, and it's just gone straight away. The, the lady off the view, Barbara Walters. He said, yeah. so my, he says, yeah, goodness me, that was terrible. And he said, my dad will stop working in the business when Barbara Walters stops doing TV. And he said, that's not very funny. 
He said, I don't even know who Barbara Walters is. I said, it's a it's a great line. It's yeah. a killer line. It is. Just take it off me. It's a good line. It's American. Everybody knows of Barbara Walters. She's been on television since, since it started. She's, been, she's like 150 years old. Trust me, it'll land. It, so he did it and he delivered it. And then they all started laughing. And the problem is then he didn't think they were going to laugh. And therefore, he didn't know what to do. So he was like stuck on stage halfway through, his, you know, and, and he didn't know what to do because he didn't believe that the humour would, would travel. So that's the other interesting dynamic is I, I here's the most, here's the biggest challenge for me as a, as a coach. We're not working on some, some conceptual idea that they might be able to put in practice of humans down the road that might help. They've got to talk in a month. Right. And when we sit down and write it out, they've got to make a decision. They either do the talk that we've agreed or they don't. And I've never had one who said that they didn't. So they look me in the eye and working with a guy that they don't really know sometimes. And we sat there doing lines like that. And mm-hmm. they've got to stand up and deliver it with confidence. Right. So they have so, to have faith in so, you and what, what you brought from doing the kind of work that you've you've done. They've got to believe in me, and and that's that's the that's I wouldn't say that's a pitfall, but as a coach, mm-hmm. that's very difficult because I don't get a second chance. No, you, you have know, to. It's, yeah. not, it's not like I've got a bodybuilding coach, right? So I have a bodybuilding coach, and when I go and see him, he teaches me something. And if the following week I've eaten donuts and pizza and I put some weight on, then we can start again. You know, he'll go, "Why have you eaten donuts and pizza?" And I go, "I've had a bad week." Just, I just wanted to eat donuts and pizza. And he's like, fine. Right, well, we need to readdress, recalibrate, we start again. But I don't yeah. get that chance. They come and spend eight hours with me, or 14 or whatever it is, one or two days. We drill down, we give them a speech, they walk away with it, and they either use it or they don't. And I don't get a second chance. And if it doesn't work, then it's my head on the block. So that's the the challenge, if you like. So you got it, you got it. There's, no, uh, there's no outs. You have to do the best with them at that time taking from them what really is core and fundamental to where they're speaking. And they, you know, have to, like you said, you have, once you've formulated that, then it's the practice and kind of helping them with the things that they're scared of. And then they have to go out and, and deliver it, which is, which is, which could, as a keynote, I, I understand, like you're up there and there's no choice. You have to deliver it. Um, and then, you know, if it's the first time to an audience, it, that can be kind of, um, you know, big too, because you want to do your best. So for people that are thinking of connecting or they want to speak better, where, where, where can they get a hold of you to, or even have a chat with you if um, you're open to that, David? Or you said you also have a podcast. Well, I'm very heavily present on Facebook and LinkedIn. I post on there five, six times a week and I post content. So if you want to go onto Facebook and LinkedIn, then you will be able to get lots of videos of me giving you little tips, 60 second tips. And there's loads of material on there that will help you become a better speaker. So first and foremost, go on there and just, you know, suck my brain dry or Facebook and LinkedIn, because I really believe in, in sharing what it is that I know. If you want to get in touch with me direct, then my website is creatingpresentationrockstars.com. Okay, great. So what have I learned? Hmm. I've learned a lot. Um, I think what I'm walking away with is um, just practicing and being present. But the, if you're at a certain level, that maybe it's hard for you to get the message. And sometimes getting the kind of coach that is direct and straight down the front line is maybe the way to go. And it's definitely, it seems like that's how David works. So for anybody interested in becoming a uh, a rock star on stage connect with David or check him out on LinkedIn and um, as you know I talk about authenticity and leadership either at home or at work if you're wanting more information on that you can go to roxanderhodge.com for slash quiz do a mini quiz really quick and we'll send you a report uh, with some recommendations David thanks so much for your time and maybe your paths will cross at some point when I'm up across the pond again all right take care everyone we'll talk to you soon Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom blueprint. We'll see you next time.
on Authentic Living with Roxanne.